We are now with chapter one. As I said, there's, there's a lot in, uh, in every chapter. Uh, I'm not really going precisely according to the notes, more or less. But you will see that every chapter is actually sort of a chapter or a summary out of a book. We've got a book with the name The Covenant and You. Unfortunately, it's not yet on the, it's on the internet. It is, it is finished in Afrikaans and English, but my wife still needs to edit it. <laughs> She's got more work than, uh, than she can always handle, but it will be somewhere in this year we will always have that, also have that on the, on the internet. So the first chapter that we're going to uh, deal with here is the eternal covenant. Now I think most people have never heard the word eternal covenant. It is a total absent word. Uh, I must say if it wasn't for the fact that I was maybe studying theology in the Dutch Reformed Church, you know, I wouldn't have heard it because it's, it's a foreign sort of amongst the, the charismatics, the renewal people and so. They, they like the word covenant, you know, but, but there's lots of covenants in the Bible. And covenant, the word covenant basically means a, a, a relationship agreement, if you can say it like that. God always deals in terms of covenants. So there's a golden thread that running through the whole history of man in time and outside of time. That, that you can link together with covenants. Yes, there's much more to it. We will come to the next chapter next time, and that is the, about the kingdom. Uh, that is extremely important. But maybe we we'll just start out with the covenant, with the sense of, you know, because the Bible says that everything happened before time, everything that happened in time, happened even before time, happened in the eternal covenant. In the eternal covenant, there was only God Himself, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they were in fellowship with each other. They were in a total fulfillment with each other. They were just enjoying each other. They were just having a nice time, if you can say it like that. But they were so full of themselves and the success they are and the love they have that, 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 that what we ever have is the creation and especially the creation of man was an overflow of this fellowship in God with himself. He had too much for himself, so he, we want, he wanted some beings that he could share his glory and his heart and his power and his what everything to share it with man. And man was the was the uh, was the creation of a beautiful story in terms of uh, success. Man was an overflow of love, as it's supposed to be. So so man was not just you know something God created there. He think oh let's just make this. We try this, you know. Okay, this is not so good, let's do it better, you know. Adam was not good enough, so let's create Eve, you know. No, everything was perfect. Everything was according to design. Everything was according to God's own heart, the blueprint that was in Him. And everything was an overflow. You know, God is not a God that sort of, you know, He's experimenting, you know, let's try this, let's see this. God is a God that's, that's living out of His heart. He's going for something. Nothing can stop Him to get there. And he knew that along the line that whatever creatures he made in terms of angels and men, you know, and mankind could bring problems and whatever. But he could, he had a solution for everything. Nothing was for him the end of the world, you know, and a surprise and a hiccup and a, and an immense thing that stopped him. Yes, yes, what man did was in, enormously tragic and, you know, it was rebellion and whatever. But God always knew that he had more in himself than man could do wrong. He could always seek anything in life. Because he's God. He can, and although it would cost him his own life, that is a very severe sacrifice, you know, to pay. He could fix it. He could do something. God was never in a depression, you know. God was never in a negativity and think, okay, let's do this. But oh my goodness, you know, when I just think of that, you know. No, God was always... In a mode of, you know, whatever problem will, will appear along the road, I will solve it, I will get through it. Because why? Because I am God. And nothing is bigger than God. So it, it was not a question of, you know, will I take the chance to create man? He said, listen, I'm going to create him. And I'm going to create him like me, and I'm going to give him this freedom. And yes, there's in, that is the tremendous risk and whatever. And he took the risk, but he's bigger than the risk himself. And, and everything that happened in our life in time happened before the foundation of the world, was known before the foundation of the world. There's no surprise, what, what, what if a surprise you and me on earth is not surprising him uh, any, uh, at any time. The Bible says 
The council of redemption was, was determined, you know, before time. Acts 2 verse 23. In Him Jesus was given to you by the before determined council and foreknowledge of God. Uh, Acts 4.28 In order to do whatever your hand and your counsel determined before to, to be done. Now I was sort of introduced, you know, to this, let's say, eternal covenant by the word of predestination, you know. It's not the wrong word, it's in the Bible, but it is, I believe, not correctly defined according to the, to the let's say, the, the, um, the Reformed theology that's making a lot out of predestination. As if everything in the eternal covenant is just one word, predestination. Listen people, whatever we talk about, it's an enormous important key, must be seen and interpreted in the light of Christ. There is no such thing like predestination, okay? There's, there's hundred people here, God loves this hundred, He wants this, you know, but those is predestined to die, you know. And, you know, where's Christ in this whole thing? You know, God is not focusing upon you. God is not predestining, you know, according to you and your performance and your whatever and your race and color or whatever, you know. God's predestination is always according to Christ. He has predestined us when we read Ephesians 1 verse 3 and 4, you know, it says, God chosen us before the foundation of the world. He has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in Christ before the foundation of the world. He predestined us to be holy and without blemish before Him in love. In Him, in Him, in Him, in Him, everything that God is doing, is doing it through Christ. He created through Christ, in Him, through Him, back to Him. Everything is in Him. At least all theologians are, are ones that the, that the two words in Christ is the key to the whole Bible. That's true. We will get to that. It's one of the chapters in Christ. It, that is surely the key. You know, but, but if it's the key, let's make sure, you know, what is this key all about? I've never found a book about in Christ. In my whole life. I mean, I've been reading books like mad. It's just as if we don't answer the question, what does it mean to be in Christ? You know, what is in Christ? What is God's perspective of in Christ, you know? We're just assuming a lot of things. Uh, but we don't go to the Word and make sure, what does God really think about it? And maybe in this course I will put all the, let's say, the possibilities in front of you. You can go and sort it out for yourself. But let me tell you, most of the stuff you're going to hear, you've maybe never heard of a possibility beforehand. Okay, so, so the council of redemption and everything was finished before the foundation of the world. The, the eternal covenant is above time. And as we said, it's not so easy to talk about this and to think about it because we are, we are, our spirit is above time, but we are living in time. You know, and we constantly want to draw a line and before and before this and after this, you know. But the moment you go above time, there's no before this or whatever, you know. It's before the foundation of the world because that was the beginning of our time. But, you know, is that there or is it there or is it there? Because everything of this time thing is in God. And we are limited by time, but God is not limited by time. You see, you see, when you and me receive Christ, that listen to the last year, people normally say, you know, it, take, it takes you 20 years to mature in Christ. No, well, when you receive Christ, you receive the full mature Christ. No, you haven't received a portion here, a portion here, because you've received a person. But we are only, our walk of maturity is only restricted. In time, in terms of the, how many time it takes you to discover who you are, to embrace who you are, and to apply and to start to live who you are. That things took time, you know, but you get people that can, that can listen clearly and they can, they can uh, embrace quickly and they can run with the thing and in two years time you see an enormous amount of maturity. Then you find people that don't even mature in 20 years. Why? And it's got nothing to do with, you know, with God or whatever. God has finished His work. God's works, according to Hebrews 4 verse 3, was finished before the foundation of the world. God's works was finished before the foundation of the world. You know, but God is still working. I wait for God for a work to do. Listen, God is not working any longer. God.
God is in a rest at the moment. You know, you just need to listen what He worked and you need to work out what He already worked. And the whole purpose of the earth was not to, for God to find a place where He can work. It's a place to, to, to create once and for all and to sit back and have a relationship with you. You see, but our lives is in such a mess that we constantly need and uh, work in our lives to get something, to break something or whatever. But whatever you need is already provided in Christ. You just need to get the knowledge about it. It is not that God can give you anything more in time that He has already given before the foundation of the world. Because if I have given my son, what more can I give you, Romans 8? I can give you nothing more. And I've already blessed you, Ephesians 1 verse 3, with every spiritual blessing before the foundation of the world, before you were created, before the fall, and, and, and before the cross, and before you've accepted me, and even after, after you've accepted me. Because whatever I've done, I haven't done because of you and to put this you and be, this time and your life and this phase and whatever. I've done it before the foundation of the world. I finished it there and I'm at rest concerning it. It's only you that's running around in circles. God says, it's not me. I mean, I'm not trying to, to work up a maturity here for you. I've given you everything that pertains to life and godliness. Whatever more can you have from me? And then our prayers are constantly, God, please give me, give me, give me, give me. And God says, what can I give you? Please, just show me. Because I've given you everything. I've given you myself. I've given you heaven. I've given you my kingdom. There's nothing of me that I haven't given you. But the problem is you don't know what you do not know. And you live in the gospel of salvation that's constantly telling you, you need to get something, you need to get something, you need to get something, you need to arrive, you need to get there. Not knowing that you have arrived, mm. at least in Christ. Mm. We have even arrived before the foundation of the world. You see, it's, it's, not, it's not God that must arrive with us. You know, God knows that we've arrived. God knows He's given, you know. It is us that's constantly uh, uh, running around like, like ants, you know, looking for the next blessing, the next this, the next phase, the next move of God and whatever. God says, my goodness, man, I mean, I'm on the move all my years. I mean, I've, my, I've never stopped moving. I mean, there's nothing new in my move. There's not a new season in my move. You know, we have seasons, but in God's world, there's not seasons. There's only one season there. Life, abundance, love, everything in abundance. That's the only season in God's world. We experience seasons because we go through times of difficultness and things that people bring into your life. And it's not necessarily wrong. But don't, but don't think of Christ that way. The provision is still the same. You may be in a winter or in a whatever. The provision is the same. You're still the fullness in Christ. Mm -hmm. Nothing has changed from God's side. Mm -hmm. and, the, and, and, the, and the only way to get out of your season is to... Get out of your season and get into God's world and start to look to your season from God's viewpoint. Mm -hmm. Then you will see that God sees that there's a fact, there's a difficult time, yes. But listen, it doesn't need to be like that because I've provided also for that. Mm -hmm. See the provision and get out of the thing. Mm -hmm. Because everything was predestined and given and, and, and uh, uh, for us before the foundation of the world. It is all that God had Himself and it is above time. You, sorry, I'm busy losing myself. <laughs> the Bible says, you know, uh, it, 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 it talks about the beginning, before the beginning. The word in, for beginning in, in Hebrew is, uh, is arche. It means that which is of value. You see, you see, value didn't come into existence with the creation of man. The creation of man is just a value that existed from the beginning that just overflowed into time. You know, it is, everything began before the foundation of the world. Everything was finished before the foundation of the world. I mean, God is at the moment, at the end of the world, He experienced the Antichrist, He experienced Mageddon, He experienced everything in the Bible He can experience now, because everything for God is in the now. There's no, there's no issue for Him. There's no reason for Him to stress about anything in life. Because if we can sit and, like the Bible says, we are in Him, in Christ, in heavenly places, so that we can look from heavenly places and get our reference correct. 
then things will change in our lives. And, and, the, and, and one point to is, you know, what is the purpose of the eternal covenant? One of the purposes is to get your reference point correct. Yes, you are on earth. You've got a flesh side that's here. Yes, there's seasons here. And there's even maybe spiritual seasons. We're not against it and saying it doesn't exist. But it is facts. It is not stuff that we are suppressed to and you know it is ruling over us. But in our spirits we sit in the heavenly places. We rule over these seasons and things and whatever. We rule over our circumstances. And whatever happens in your life, the first thing you must do is get your reference correct. You know, the reference is go back to, go back to before the foundation of the world. I was blessed with everything in Christ. I'm, a, I'm the best success in the, this world has ever seen. You know, God, God has chosen me, you know. I am according to His, His, uh, His, His uh, image and likeness, you know. He's given me everything, you know. The moment I get my reference correct, you know, I get a different way in what I handle my problem. And my attitude towards the whole thing changed. You know, I'm no longer in a negativity. I start to get thankful even for the problem that came to me. Because the only reason a problem appears in your life is, for, is to show the glory of God. <laughs> that's the reason the problem is there. It's for you to tap in this vast provision that's in you, Christ in you, and get a skill and get over it and show to the world that Christ in me, the hope of glory, is far bigger than anything outside of me. There's nothing, anything outside of us that's bigger than what is inside of us. He that's in us is bigger than he that's in the world. It is number one to get my reference point correct. It is also to get an anchor and an origin. I mean, I'm anchored at a point that can't move. I mean, God hasn't changed. God hasn't changed His mind concerning me. You know, <coughs> we have changed with the fall of man. We have changed our thinking. We have changed uh, our value systems. We've changed a lot. We will get to that when we go to get to the fall of man. But in God's world, nothing ever changed. Nothing. What God thought of you from the beginning, He's still thinking of you with creation. He's still thinking of you after the fall. He's still thinking of you at the cross. And yes, Jesus came to release it again, restore it again, redeem it again. And He's still thinking the same thing now. Whatever your situation may be. There's nothing changed with God. The thinking that you have concerning you now is the same right through the ages back, right into the eternal covenant. Because there's no reason why you had to change his thinking. Because nothing changed. You changed. But with him, nothing changed. You know, you changed, but you had the provision before even you changed. Before your problem came into your life, you know, you had the solution, you had the provision, you had everything. And, you know, and, 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 and to start to think out of that world, you know, we always listen to the news and then we hear something negative and then we go, ooh, you know, let us large long. You know, that doesn't say there's some stuff that we must not do. Of course it is, you know, but according to the truth you know what we experience here is the facts of the flesh life we live in and we are in a fleshly life but there's a truth above in, in above time there's a truth about your life and the truth is christ because as he is 1 john 4 verse 16 so are you that is the truth of my life you know uh you may have only 50 rand in your pocket, but you're not a poor person. Because the truth of your life is not determined by what is in your pocket. It's determined by who you are in Christ. Yes, he doesn't say that's the fact. You only have 50 rand in your pocket. That's the fact. And you need to be honest with the fact. But listen, that is not the final say of who you are. That's not the final say of your financial situation. Because there's a spirit world that is an anchor, that is a provision, that is a source, that is something out of which we live into this world. This world has never ever have the final say about anything in life. The world where God is, is has got the final say. Therefore it is so important what we say in this course, what's called the mystery, is that God wants you to see the whole of the universe story, if you can say it, the, the history of man or the redemption story. He wants you to see the whole story from his viewpoint. Because that's the truth. 
And by that it doesn't cancel out what happened in time. Cancel out meaning it doesn't happen, you know, we're living in, in uh, denial. No, man, the fall of man never happened, you know, we know, no, 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 it happened. It's true. It's devastating. But it was only devastating for you and me because we've lost the reference of our God. You know, the biggest problem in the Garden of Eden was not that man fall into, fell into sin. Sin was not a big problem. The big problem was you lost God. You lost your kingdom. You lost your mandate. You lost your provision. You lost your identity. You've lost everything that could help you in life. That's why sin is ruling over you. You've got no anchor to go back to. You don't know what is your anchor. You don't know what was your identity really. You don't have anything that you can draw into your world and speak. You, there's no life or light that you can bring into your world and speak to this darkness. That's the biggest problem of Adam and Eve was not the darkness. It was the absence of light. <laughs> Good one. And God's only intention of bringing Christ was not to have a big battle with the devil. He knew the devil is not to fight for him. Yes, of course Jesus had to pay, but the Lamb was already slain in Romans, uh, Revelation 13, eight, before the foundation of the world. Before Jesus came to earth, it was all over. The fight was settled. I mean, the fight was settled before the fight came. <laughs> everything was settled in God's world, before everything happened. And there's no reason for God to get upset, but just to bring light back for you and say, listen, my, listen, just look at the truth. <laughs> Just come back to the truth. Just allow the truth about me and who, who, who you are and what I've made you to break this cycle of negativity of thinking about who you are. Because you will always battle and battle and battle with sin and you will never conquer sin. You know why? Because you were never designed to conquer sin. Mm. You know, we fall into sin and we are very disappointed in ourselves because we can't conquer the thing. Let me tell you one thing. God is not one second disappointed in you in falling into sin and not conquering it. Why? Because you can never conquer it. He's never designed you for that. He's designed you to be a bride. And the bride was not made to fight the devil or sin. Therefore he said, listen, can you not get to a point where you realize it's normal not to, not to win any fight with sin? It's normal. I'm not disappointed in you. That's, that's reality. That's the truth about your life. Because the truth is that I've made you for me. I've made you for fellowship with me, to hear me, to experience me. To, that I can live in you, that I can speak to you, that you can respond to me. You're the only being in this whole universe in whom I, as the fullness of God, can stand. No, if that is not significance, I mean whatever in life can be significant. And God said, listen, your, your greatest is not according to your reputation in fighting sin. Your reputation in fighting sin will always be zero. Because that's normal. Because I've never created you to fight sin. You cannot fight sin. You cannot, you're not made for that. I've made, anything in life is only a success within the framework of the purpose the thing was created for. I mean, you buy yourself a new Audi and you go out into the, to the farm, you know, and you see, oh man, they, they, they're busy plowing, let's see what this Audi can do, you know, and you put the plow behind the Audi, and three meters later, the whole engine is blown up, you know, and then you take the Audi back to the garage, you said, this, this, is a, this is the biggest mess that you could ever sell to me, I mean, you could even plow for three meters, and they will laugh at you, you see, but listen, this thing was not designed to, 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 for the plow, it was designed for people. It was designed for a tar road. It was designed for a good uh, gravel road. Highway. And it, the, 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 anything is only a success within the framework of the purpose it was created for. On earth. Now you, now you test yourself concerning sin and you lose the battle and you say you're a failure and God says, since when? I mean, I've not created you for sin, so since when are you a failure? I mean... I know you will fail. It's normal. But our sin theology has preached through our sin. Sin, 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 sin. You must get out of sin. You must get out of it. Get out of it. Listen, sin is sin, people. Sin still remains wrong. Mm -hmm. If it's before the cross or after the cross, I'm not, I'm not taking away, you know, that sin is maybe something good or allowable. It's not what I'm saying. The point is, don't measure yourself in terms of sin. Because... God says, I want you to measure yourself in terms of light, not darkness. Mm -hmm. 
You are an offspring and an overflow of light and love. You are not an overflow of the devil and the, the kingdom of darkness. You were never created for that world. You will never flourish there. You will never be happy there. I've never seen a person that can, that can constantly enjoy sin. Because you cannot enjoy sin constantly. It's, it's, it, in the beginning you enjoy it and then you go into, the Bible says, what is Christ's clip in your mouth? It becomes like, like gravel. gravel in your mouth, you know. Because, because your design cannot enjoy sin. Because you were designed for God Himself, not for sin. You know, and, and here we sit on earth and we're fighting each other and we are in this religious thing of religious groups, you know. And the one is better than the other and we just divide, you know, and the one, you know. And God says, what are you busy with? I mean, can you not at, maybe at one point come and sit with me and just look from my viewpoint? You know, what do I think about people? We'll get to that. How do I look at people? You know, how do I measure people? You know, and we're fighting here, you know, is it acceptable, gay or not gay, you know, this sinner, drunkard or not, you know, we don't know how to handle this stuff, because we don't know how God handles this stuff, and it's actually not so difficult, uh, what, what, what he's doing, so we, we've lost our anchor, we've lost our reference point, um, um, and God wants us to, to come back, you know, the eternal covenant is all about relationship, because the covenant is a covenant because there was people of God that was in relationship with Himself. You know, um, more or less, you know, we can, we can say uh, in the first place, you know, when we see this, this relationship between the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, you must understand that God has created you out of His Son in the image of Himself so that you can have the same quality of relationship. You know, we always think, okay, I get to know God, you know, luckily I'm now in the church, you know, and I've got the relationship, you know, but, you know, I'm still on earth, it, it will never be very good, you know, but as, if, if, I, if I just can have enough, you know, that I can survive, and that we can just go on, and listen, God says, I don't think like that. I mean, if I've given you something, I've given it to you according to me, I've given you faith according to Christ, I've given you holiness according to Christ. I've given you righteousness according to Christ. I give you entrance to me according to what Christ has. I give you the possibility to live in my presence and have intimacy and relationship with me according to what Christ has. Because you are an outflow of my son, you are the bride of my son, you have the same privilege and where he is and what he is, that's what you are. You, by no means you have any inferior relationship with me. You know, you know that, that, that far off, you know, and, and one day in heaven we will see the face of God and then we will know God. Listen, you can know God now. It's written the Bible to reveal Himself. But we have set up this stuff in us, you know, that if I can just uh, know enough, you know, this little bit, God says, listen, uh, it is not for you to, you know, to be bragger of you and, uh, you know, I know all or whatever, but listen, come in and get to know me. You've got the right, you've got the privilege, I give it to you. It's not because of what you have made yourself. It's because of what I have made you. It's because of what I have done. It's because of what I have invited you into. I invite you into a relationship of the same quality of what my son experienced. There's no inferiority that I give to you. I don't give you an inferior relationship. You know, you stay in the outside. No, 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 you stay in the inside. You don't stay in the servant's quarter. You're a son. In the house. You're not a servant in the house. You're not like, you know, lots of our religious thinking, you know, then there's the, then there's the apostles and the priests and the prophets, you know, and then we are the members, you know, and, and poor us members, you know, we must just listen. Listen, I believe in the fivefold ministry. But listen, the fivefold ministry is nothing more than just a member with good experience. That's all. And you, you became nothing bigger than anyone else. We are, just, we are just members of the body of Christ. The one has just got more, more experience than the other. The one has got just more a talent in the prophetic way and another one in the teacher's way or in a pastoral way. I mean, that's just normal because we all differ in talents and in gifts. I mean, what, what's the problem about it? It doesn't give me any authority over you. 
which is to get the power of the body of Christ. You know, and it's not like, oh, you know, then the prophet enters and he's got, he's got this, 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 this number one entrance to God. He has heard now from God what's going to happen in South Africa. Since when? No, I don't believe in stuff like that. We treat people as if I have heard and you can't hear, you know. Listen, you can also hear. Amen. All of everyone can hear because the relationship capacity is for everyone the same. Yes, maybe God will share more prophetic stuff with the prophetic people. That's true. He will share more hard stuff with the pastoral people that's got a pastoral gift. Not because of anything, because you can't handle anything. You can't, I mean, you can't be everything and everything. The only everything and everything is Christ. You know. And it's not because the one is better than the other. It's just so that, so that, so that we can have the best of the best through different people. But our relationship with God is the same. You know, it's not like you know, certain people hear God and they've got a vision and we don't have the vision. Listen, we have the vision. And the vision is Christ. I don't want to go further on, on, on that road. But, but, but listen, there's nothing inferior to you. That's one of the messages coming from the eternal covenant. If I want you, I want you like my son. I've made you like my son. I want you to be in the same situation like him. It is, it is not a question of, you know, becoming members of something. It's a question you become a citizen of the kingdom of God. You become a member of the household of God. You become my child. You become part of the family. We're not an organization. We're a family. And we will look to that to see how we can sort out all these things. And in this relationship, it's about enjoyment. It's about love. It's about it's about provision. It's about living what you are. It's about being a blessing for other people. It's just about giving expression yourself. I mean, if God is a person that is overflowing with the fullness in Him, you're supposed to be someone that's overflowing with the fullness of God. Because if He have given you, if He have blessed you with everything, every spiritual blessing before the foundation of the world, listen, you're supposed to flow something. Something is supposed to manifest around here. I mean, you're not a poor whatever in a corner with, you know, overlooked whatever person. You've got something to overflow, so overflow. That's what the eternal covenant is telling us. Is that we've got reason to rejoice on this earth. We've got reason to, to have a party on this earth. Because everything has been given us. You know, God is inspired by His Son. When He looked at His Son, He was inspired to have more like, his, more like Him. You know, you're supposed to be inspired when you look at Christ. You're supposed to be inspired when you look at yourself. I mean, you came as a solution. I mean, you came as something to this world. I mean, a few days ago, I had a guy sitting here with me, and he's so in the press, you know, so my whole life is a mess, and this, and this, and this, and this, and whatever, you know. I don't know where to start or whatever. And I said, well, listen, let me tell you one thing. I said, I said, what is the solution? Just tell me what is the solution. I said, I'm going to tell you the solution. But you must remember this. And I look him into the eyes and say, listen, this is the solution. It's called you. <laughs> you, what do you look like? You? I said, my friend, you're the solution. You're the solution to all these problems. God sent you because you are the solution. You are the person that can make a difference. You are the person that can change things. You are the person that can, that can change circumstances, technology. You can create, set up minds. You can open up businesses. You can solve the poverty thing. You are the solution. The solution is in you. Don't get depressed with what's going on on the outside. That's only the problem. That's supposed to stir you into action, man. I mean, yes, it's not good news what's going on on the outside. I'm not saying, you know, rejoice in what's going on on the outside. No, rejoice in the fact that, listen, the fact that you're still, you're still you're breathing at the moment is because you must still deliver the solution that's in you. That's why you're still here. Otherwise, God would have taken you a long time ago. He said, listen, come and sit here. I need you more than this world needs you. He said, no, 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 this world needs you more than... He said, I like you, I love you, you know, everything is fine, and I'm with you, and I got this relationship. But listen, you are my solution. 
You are my dream. You are my everything. I, I, I wake up every day just to look at you and to be proud of you and to help you and to think out something for you and to, to, to change something around you and to manifest something. That's why I've created you. And all you do is to be negative about yourself. You know, the, the, that's religion. That's what we've been taught. That's the gospel of salvation. You know, what a wretch you are. What a wretch you are. Is it really what the Bible is saying? You know, the fact that man was totally under the law of sin, does it, did it make him a wretch, you know? Yes, we lived like that, you know. But were we really that? We're going to look at the answer to that. Uh, what was God saying? And the so answer is easy. You know, if man was really this rich, why didn't God just pay Moses and solve the problem? I mean, you know why? Because Moses was not enough to solve the problem. Because Moses was not of enough value for you. Because you were bought by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. That was the only price that could pay for you. Because you were in your sin. The most precious being in this whole world. And even in that verse of scripture. It's saying that this, this Christ was known and predestined beforehand for paying this price. Why? Because no one else can pay that price. Because your value is too high. Before sin, in sin, after sin, your value never disappeared. Never disappeared. God paid for you as a sinner with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. He couldn't pay less because you were too precious. I mean, why are we not just wake up a bit and say, okay, okay, you know, maybe this sin thing is not so everything overall as what we said. Maybe if we start to look from God's side, you know, without uh, uh, ignoring what happened in time, you know, there's another picture here. That, that the picture us for another view about myself and what's, what God was seeing. Okay. And, and, and they were always continually together. Uh, oh, you can read it, everything there. The, the, the Trinity in the covenant, and that was God's purpose, is to have you continually everywhere in the family, with him, at his side, uh, in, in a good relationship. Okay, we see that quickly, quickly, we can say that the Father is the one in the Trinity, you know, that always making the plans, at the idea, the initiative, you know, always bringing the thing into action, the initiator of everything. Jesus was the one that was always... Uh, 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 let's say, uh, uh, activating, doing, and eight food, or what, what you call that in English? Executor. The executor of what was in the heart of the Father. Jesus saw the desire of God towards a person like man to share his life. And he saw the, the hunger of God to share this enormous amount of love that he had for mankind. And, but they knew that man would fall into sin. And Jesus said, but don't worry, I will fix it. I will pay for it. Because he was the only one that would pay. But they're hanging on the cross in Hebrews 12. He's saying that for the pleasure that was in front of me, I could bear the cross. What pleasure? The pleasure of the Father seeing you again. You know, Jesus didn't come to this world, you know, and he was part of his heart. I had to die for sin, you know, sin is a whatever. Yes, sin was... Sin was so serious that it, that, it, that it took his life. That was how serious sin was. But you know, Jesus went to the cross and he knew it was a terrible thing. But he said, the pleasure in my heart to see my father, how he will rejoice when you can eventually come back into his house, come back to his presence. I mean, for the pleasure of seeing that, you know, I'll take the cross. No big deal. I'll give my life for that. Why? Because behind the cross there was something beautiful. There was a Father that was waiting for us. There was a Father that was longing for us. Jesus just didn't pay, you know, because he was inevitable and he was the only one, so he just paid, you know, and, and let's just change this horrible story into something that's maybe something good. No! This story was good from the beginning till the end. Yes, it had certain consequences along the road because of our decision. But Jesus never wavered. He never wavered. Why? Because he was inspired by what he saw in the face of his father before the foundation of the world. He never wavered in it. He said, man, it's all worth it. To have 
more millions with us together in heaven one day or in the kingdom of God, together, you know, experiencing the same fellowship of the same quality and the same freedom. It's all worth it. I mean, we've got it. We can give it. So let's give it. Nothing was a problem for God ever. No problem of you and me was even uh, hindering God in any way, you know, hindering meaning, you know, stopping God. Nothing could, could frustrate God in reaching the point that He wanted to reach. Why? Because there was always more in their hearts than we would, ever we could produce. And that does not justify what man has done. Hear me clearly. It was enormously serious. We will come to that. But God was always bigger than that. The eternal covenant was always far bigger than that. And to, and to, you know, and to get to a point, at least after the cross of Calvary, not to so much talk again of sin. You know, when I listen to sermons, I, I hear at least 70 to 90% you preach sin, sin, your problem, sin, sin, sin. I mean, of course, man, we can preach 100% about sin, but it solves nothing. Preaching about sin solves nothing. Preaching about darkness just brings more darkness. You need to preach the light. You need to preach the solution. You need to preach what, what was the other thing that can break that cycle. And the other thing is the thing that's before the foundation of the world. That was there before darkness. That was there after darkness, in darkness, and broke the hold of darkness. That is the good news. That does not say I sit here and I see you in a depression. I can see with my eyes you are experiencing depression. But that doesn't qualify or disqualify you. It's only your feelings. It's, not, it's the facts, but it's not the truth. Mm -hmm. My responsibility is to bring you the truth, the anchor of your truth that, that starts before the foundation of the world in the eternal covenant. And to give you that picture... So that you can understand that all the stuff that's hindering us is actually is so much, so much things that the devil think out, you know, it's clipper stones that he throw in your way. And God says, yes, step over it and get over it. Okay. Uh, the Holy Spirit was always the one that is, uh, that is helping to, to, to implement the thing and to bring it to full reality and full manifestation. The Holy Spirit never talked about Himself. He always talked about Jesus. Therefore, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. Because of the Trinity, the Father is the acting one. And even when we pray, we pray to the Father. Because it's the Father who wants the relationship. But everything is through Christ. Everything in this world is through Christ. In Christ. In Him we live and move and have our being. In Him, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. And the Holy Spirit works back to Christ. Because Christ is the, let's say, the, the, the point where we, where we cross the Trinity, if you can say it like that. Because Christ came and we brought us back into Christ so that we can get back to the Holy Spirit and to the Father. And it's not wrong to talk to Christ and to pray to Christ, but it is, He is not the focus of our prayer. Yes, it is wonderful to thank Him and to honor Him, but actually your focus is the Father because the Father is the initiator. It's not wrong to mention the Holy Spirit or even talk to Him, you know, but it is not, I think, biblical to constantly we talk to the Holy Spirit. Listen, when you talk to the Father, you talk through Christ, through the Holy Spirit. It's impossible that you cannot because the three is one. But the focus is the Father. And we will see later on why is that the reason that, that He is the focus. It's, it's a very interesting thing. Let me just see where is my time. Um, uh, 1.7, the secret of Jesus' life. It's very important. In a certain sense, Jesus was the first Christian on earth. He was the first one to live the normal Christian life. What Jesus lived is the normal Christian life. But he lived it in a certain way that is very interesting. You must realize when Jesus came to earth, he came in a body. His mind was not pre, let's say, pre-programmed. When he opened up his eyes, his mind was empty. Like any one of us that was born, his mind was empty. Yes, in his spirit he was God. But then he, he, he became bigger and bigger or whatever, you know. But he constantly listened to his spirit. And he read the word and he read stuff like, you know, that they will become a savior and whatever. And it resonated in his spirit. And he started to see more and more that maybe I am this person that's been talking about you. You know, it's, it's like it's speaking to you. It's revelation knowledge. 
You know, that thing that you read about something in the Word and it's, it, it's, like, it's like light. Mm. You know, and then people say, yeah, but you must have the right text of Jesus and this. You know, yes, yes, it's true, it's true, you know, but revelation knowledge comes and says, but you are this person. Uh, and then you need, to, you need to take that thing for yourself. I mean, Jesus would have never gone to the cross if he didn't read about himself, discovered himself in the Bible, identified him more and more and more with it. It took him, it took him 33, 30 years to discipline his, his flesh dimension, to identify with this creative purpose in his spirit and say, listen, this is what I'm going for. I'm for this thing here. This is what it's all about. And he more and more talked to his father and he, and he, and he gave utterance to this reference that was in his spirit about this is what you're here for. Eventually, he was so strong in himself what he heard from the father. He always said, I can do nothing out of myself. I say nothing out of myself. I only do what I see my father is doing. I only say what I see my father is saying. And it's the same with us. There's nothing, you are a bride. There's nothing in you that's the, you know, the moment Marihan marries me, you know, and I am this, let's say, this big businessman with this property portfolio, whatever, the moment she marries me, she becomes the same. You know, she doesn't need to become something. She, she, she's easy. She's got my authority. She's got my name. She's got my whatever. Everything becomes hers. She needed to fight for it. Or, you know, she needed to associate it herself with it. And the more you associate yourself with Christ and say, but as He is, so am I. If Christ could have lay hands on someone and chase the demon or the sickness, then I can lay my hand and chase the demon and sickness. Why? Because of the fact that my name is Adam? No. Because of, I've got the same mandate than Christ. I'm a brother of Christ. I've got the same position. I I've, I've, do not have the same role because Christ is the Savior of the world. I am not the Savior of the world. I've got my own creative purpose. But I discover my creative purpose and I I identify myself with it and I, I embrace it and I start to live it because I've heard that is what the Father is saying. He said, this is what you must do. This is what you must say. This is what you must activate. So then you go and do it because the Father has said it. It's not me sitting there and thinking out a nice big vision, you know, and say, oh, this is pretty nice if we... No. Listen from the Father. You were sent for a purpose. You, the Bible says that you know we we, uh, we we called for we called for fellowship with the Father, but we we've got the creative purpose in us, and we have a personality and the gifts and talents that's according and for that purpose, and we need to discover it. And when the Father tells you, listen, this is why you this and this and this, grab it, embrace it, uh, 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 acknowledge it. It's, it's the opposite than, oh no, you know, I'm nothing. Let's, I, must be, I must become less and less, you know, I must become a worm. No, you cannot live your creative purpose as a worm. You, you, you are something, you are someone. Yes, you are a, a unique person and you must become proud of it because that's what God has made you. And you, won't, you cannot live it if you cannot embrace it. I mean, Jesus didn't thought to himself, man, I cannot tell the people I'm the son of God, you know. They will swear at me and they will think I'm nuts, you know, and whatever. Well, of course, there's only one Son of God on this earth in terms of the, the salvation and the Redeemer. But he realized that is what God is saying in him. And he took on it and he embraced it. And he lived the life that he was sent for. And unfortunately, most people leave earth without living what they were sent for. Because they never embraced it. Because... And they came through a church theology where you must become less and less and less and God must become everything. You know, you must not become less. You must become what God has made you. You must become less in the sense of, yes, put your own thoughts and emotions and whatever aside. Yes, throw that away. Throw it all away. But there is a makeup here. There's a body and there's a soul and a mind and whatever here. That's nothing wrong. It's nothing evil. God wants to use it. He's got a passion in it. He's got a passion in it. He said, listen, acknowledge it. It's beautiful. It is so beautiful that you will live in this, this, this body of yours for eternity. Why? Because it's beautiful. It's wonderful. There's nothing wrong with it. 
Don't despise yourself. Don't look down on yourself. But also don't think you're better than anyone else. We are not better. We're just actually all the same. We are in God's image and likeness. Okay, so, so that is what we call a faith identification. You hear something from God about yourself, what He says in every aspect of you. You need to embrace it. You need to uh, uh, activate it and go for it and not be proud of it. Not, not make it say to other people, I'm more than you. you. We're never more than anyone else on earth. Okay, we just receive the same. Okay, if we quickly look at some of the implications of uh, when we close down here of the eternal covenant. You know, we can quickly summarize and, and say lots of things. I mean, we've already said, you know, you were chosen before the foundation of the world. You were blessed before the foundation of the world. Uh, I mean, this is, this is mind-blowing. This is incredible. The Bible says there in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 13, But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brothers, beloved of the Lord, because God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation through the sanctification of the Spirit and believe in the truth. From the beginning God created you as I've chosen you for salvation that you will live the life that I'm living. Nothing less. Um, the Lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. 1 Peter 1, 18 to 20 it, It's saying there, the Lamb without blemish and without spot, indeed having been foreknown before the foundation of the world, but revealed in these last times for you. There's nothing new for God on this earth that's happening around here. The Lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. If this is the only thing you can take with you tonight is this. Listen, before the fall of man happened, it was solved. Amen. There is no reason to make any issue about the fall of man. It happened. Yes, we can study it. We're going to study it. We're going to look what was the implications and whatever. But listen, there's no reason to make an issue about it. There's no reason to pump every person you see with the sin thing and the wrath of God and whatever. Because it was solved before it came. Yes, it doesn't... It doesn't uh, uh, it, it's not good that you go on and sin. Yes, of course. I mean, and there's implications and we need to deal with it and talk about it. But listen, my approach to you is not to look at you as a sinner. You know, and we in the church world even talk about Christ as a saviour of the world. He came to save the sinners. But after He saved us and after we have accepted Him, we still remain sinners saved by grace. <laughs> you never get from this thing, man. You're a sinner, you're a sinner, you're a sinner, you're a sinner. You will remain a sinner. And guess what will you live? You will live a sinner's life. Why? Because you see yourself as a sinner. You cannot live outside what you believe and see and speak about yourself. You cannot. It's impossible. And, and I don't find it in the Bible that God speaks about people as sinners, sinners, sinners. No. You know, the, the, the good question is, what is a sinner? <laughs> the even bigger question is, what is sin? You know, we haven't even settled the, the, the definition of sin in the church world. I'll, I'll show you. You know, the moment we have to understand the definition of the Bible, things become very easy, you know. Are you still a sinner or not a sinner? When are you a sinner? You know, but we must, we're going to settle that thing. But the point is, listen, from God's side, there's no reason to make a fuss about sin. The biggest reason why we in the Christian world are battling the sin problem is because we are making a fuss about it as if it's not settled. Why do you want to talk hours and hours about something that is settled, but you talk about it as if it's not settled? Uh, why? You know why? Because you have not seen it. Because you don't experience it that way. That's why you make an issue about it. I know. Out of my own life. Grace and eternal life was given before the foundation of the world. 2 Timothy 1 verse 9. Where saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose. Uh, and grace which was given to us in Christ before the eternal times, before time began. God gave Christ an eternal life before time began. It was not an invention along the way, you know, and a, a plan B, you know, when man came with a plan A, you know. No, God had only one plan, and that was Him. He was the plan. And He just knew that whatever you can think of, I am bigger than that. I'm going to do, I'm going to live what is in my heart. I'm going to give myself 
till the point that I will win your heart. And yes, there will be people that will not respond to it. It's up to them. But I will find enough people that will respond to me that wants to live in this eternal covenant that we are living in. Hebrews 4 verse 3, God's works were finished before the foundation of the world. For we have believed, we who have believed do enter into the rest. As he said, I have sworn in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. Uh, God is not busy working and working, you know. Then in Isaiah 40, you know, Isaiah is a very interesting book, just to quickly, you know, Isaiah 1 to 39 is, 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 is God's rough in terms of, you know, the sin and the sin problem and everything is a mess, you know. But then in Isaiah 40 to 66, it's the best gospel that you will ever find in the Old Testament. It's speaking about God will come and then He will rescue us, He will save us, He will make a highway, He will give us a new heart, you know, whatever. And it's the same prophet. He will he even prophesy about the guy that will come and re, re, release them and re, uh, help them, you know, the king and whatever. And that's why the theologians want to cut off 40 to 66 and put it in 150 years later in history. Because it happened 150 years later in, in terms of Israel, it happened then. But, but, but God saw it, you know, God talks about the future in the past tense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why? Because for Him it's the past tense. Mm -hmm. You know, but for us it's like a problem, you know, it's a logical problem, you know, how can something of the future, you know, and then we don't even believe in the prophetic, you know, and it's a, you know. But the point is, for God is only one thing, it's the eternal now. And the eternal now is the eternal now from ever back to ever in front. He can be in every point of history and out of history. He can be there in the eternal now. And he can speak of it as the past tense. Why? Because in his world it's past. And in his heart it is the past tense. He's not thinking about going to do it, you know. If, if it's in his heart, it is done. Even though in our world it needs still to manifest. But in his world it is done. It's over. You know, it's not a question of, okay, let's see if it's going to happen. Let's see if it's going to work out. Let, no, there's no see, 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 whatever. The, you know, God is not experimenting. Whatever God <coughs> has decided upon happens. And in His world, happened. Because God is in no place in this whole world, in and out of time. He's, he's, he's at any way, what is the word, um, wavering and wandering, you know, and, you know, at the point that he doesn't know what to do now, you know, God is an absolute convinced, God knows absolutely what he wants in life, God is absolutely convinced about you, there's no point in time where God wavered one second about you, not one second, he's absolute in persuasion, because the word faith means persuasion, God lives out of total persuasion, well, 24 hours a day, if you can say that. Anytime, anywhere, anywhere, out of time, in of time, God is the persuasion Himself. Therefore, nothing is an issue. Oh, it's difficult to define God. Eh? But you get that feeling that, you know, God says to you, listen man, don't get impressed by what's happening here. Don't, don't. Yes, doesn't mean you must not do something, you know. Of course, we see the power in ESCOM, you know. We, well, maybe you must do something, you know. But don't get into a depression and go off and make and, you know, and start a movement around the, the Zuma problem or whatever, you know. It's not God, it's not a problem for Him. It is a problem, it's not a problem for Him. But if you believe it's a problem for you, it will become a problem for you. But God's got a way over all this. Okay, let's finish here. Everything is in the past tense. Ephesians 2 verse 10. We say, God has, we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has beforehand ordained that we should walk in them. Listen here. Even your good works is already in you. God doesn't call you to think out a good work. You know, just sit there and, and you will discover there's something in you that's a good work that you want to do. The good works is in you. It's already there. It's not that we need to produce a Christian life for Him. The Christian life is in us. We just need to recognize it, see it, and give utterance to it. 
and acknowledge that it is there. You know, what do you see in yourself? Whatever you see, embrace it and live it. Because it's not that you need to go and, and find it out, you know, and design it in a certain sense. Just do it. Just expect God to define it for you. That's the beauty of everything, is that there's nothing new on this earth. Yes, we see new types of computers. Listen, it was always there in the nature. We just discovered it. It's not new for God. It's as old, it is a... Everything we discovered was there from the eternal covenant. Okay, we've already talked about the mystery. We will go on uh, right through the course to talk about the mystery and what the mystery is all about. I think we've already said enough about that. So, there is an eternal covenant where the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit were living in the most beautiful relationship with everything that you can think about beauty in relationship, overflowing, seeing everything, being everywhere, you know, desiring more people like you and me, being the solution to everything that could happen in time and outside of time, and, uh, and they were just playing, you know, there's a verse of scripture in, in, in Proverbs 8, they have 30 to 32 or whatever, it says wisdom was playing on the, on, on the, the uh, face of the earth, you know, and uh, I was playing in the front of the Creator and, I, and, and the children of God, and the people of God were my delight. You know, it's like God is, you know, I always say to people, you know, what did Jesus do to prepare Himself? Before time, you know, for the cross. He played. He played and he, 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 he indulged himself in the delight that he see in the face of his father for these, these human beings he made, you know, how he's longing for them and how he's thinking how he can bless them and how he can live life with them and do interesting things on earth. And, and I can just think that Jesus just loved it. He just said, listen, this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Is, this, is this, this expression on the face of my Father for this human beings that He's made according to my image, the image of Christ, the blueprint. And let's keep this story going. Let's make this story the biggest story in the universe. Because it's the story about you and God. The biggest story that you will ever find. Amen. Thank you very much.